Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about Ahsoka, a Star Wars Disney series. Now, I smiled and had a lot of fun with this show, but there's a there's an underlying current in a lot of these Star Wars shows that's a little weird. But I'm going to say first of all, it's actually Rebel Season 5, but... In the sense of how it groups in with The Mandalorian and the other shows, I can see where they're going with it, and I'm okay with it. Again, I had fun watching the show. There's uh, some fight scenes in here that are amazing. The story's pretty solid here and there. And Rosario Dawson is just epic and everything. And by the way, if I say something about an actor or an actress, I might not know about their personal lives. I don't know what her politics are, who she's dating, all that stuff. But... Whenever I see her in things, I'm immediately drawn to it. I love her as an actress. So, you start adding to this uh, casting with, um, you know, bringing Hayden Christensen back. Where they did some amazing stuff. I'm really happy with it as a Star Wars nerd geek. But, this shows have flaws. And when I, when I try to come and piece together my mind and I'm going to do a, a podcast on it. I start looking at those factors as this is this, all these Star Wars shows seem to be made with some love and care, which is really what the fans want after the fucking shitty debacle with the sequels. But just like Obi-Wan, like you could have had an epic, amazing series and it's not, uh, Book of Boba was kind of failed in my opinion. These have the traits and all the signs of greatness in them and just so much fun. But they make decisions that kind of, you know, make me teeter back and forth. Like, why do you make eight episodes and they're fucking 35 minutes because you said you want them to be fast, action has to be fast and whatever. No, you needed to flesh this out more. You've got Andor, which is boring as fuck in some parts, but it's an amazing show. You had 12 episodes, an, an hour or whatever. They, those, the type, this feels longer. You needed this to be longer. You needed the reveal with Thrawn to be epic. You needed the ending with Thrawn, the, the premise set up to be more epic, and it wasn't. However... You made a fun fucking season five of Rebels. You've got characters in here. Uh, Sabine Wren, uh, Harris and Dula. They actually bring in, you know, Ezra. And, you know, you're smiling. And you're, first of all, the Star Wars Rebels cartoon TV show is fucking so frustratingly dumb and shitty and good. So it's a mixed bag itself because it is a kid show technically. And they put some good themes in there. And has some great episodes. But when you do a season like that, it just for me, it wasn't uh, a, a consistent epic. I have to watch it every week. There are some weeks that are just dumb and stupid and funny and goofy, which is fine. And it's great for that. Uh, I prefer probably the Clone Wars, which started out a little slower. But, you know, once you're getting up there, the, it's solid and really captivates you from the storylines. So here we are in Ashoka. We've got a Star Wars continuation. It's fitting in around the Mandalorian season three. And it is hinted at that Ahsoka is looking to see if Thrawn is coming back and that Ezra could be alive. So spoilers, yes, at the end of Rebels, uh Thrawn is out every everybody. There's no win scenario type thing, and Ezra calls the space whales uh what, what they're called i'll probably find it out when i when i look in here um and the face the space whales actually okay so the space whales are an interstellar species of whale all right <laughs> and they go through hyperspace so they're a they're an entity a living organism that you know huge start they're the size of starships they're big some are hugely big and enormous some are a little bit small i guess of age but what they do is they migrate and they go from galaxy to galaxy through their own biological 
uh, uh, hyperspace jump type thing, which is fine, and I, I'm fine with it. I, I, I actually think some of the visuals in the show are amazing, amazing what they tried to do, and even they, they attempted things that you know make you scratch your head and go, "All right, this is cartoonish," and good, uh, you know. I, I think it's okay that they decide to do that. It's a good mixture. So, Ezra Thrawn, his major ship, his Star Destroyer, I think it's the Chimera, get taken to another galaxy, and that's kind of how that show ends. So this one is like, oh, where's Ezra? Is he still alive? And Rosaria Dawson, Ahsoka, is hearing that Thrawn is coming back, that there are planes to bring him back. All right, so that's how the show starts. But... The show does something that made me scratch my head already is like, okay, so Sabine was an apprentice. Like, when did that happen? Now, I remember Sabine had the dark saber, and because she's a Mandalorian, and possibly Kanan taught her a little bit. Okay, I don't remember. Look, I went back and I watched the last season of um, Rebels again, but I don't see any huge attachments to them as characters, so it felt odd. Like, what, wait, you were, you became a Jedi apprentice? Did, did we, did we even hint that in the Rebels show that she had Force ability, she was Force sensitive? I don't know, look, in cartoon world, you can make everybody Force sensitive, which is okay, even the world itself. Let's say Star Wars is, every living being is Force sensitive, just matters to what extent. Fine, no one, you know, it's not like, Billions of people using the Force powers, but they have intuitions and they're connected to the Force, which is still in the old school lore. So I'm okay, fine with that. There's a thing, though, that is a weight to their, you know, to their, to their conflict with each other. It just doesn't feel real, but it's done well as the show as actors and actresses, and you know, you're gonna put um, characters that are made for cartoons. Like, look, Ashoka is a made for the for Clone Wars. She was not in the lore of the movies and whatever. And I'm happy that such a beloved character is being brought to light. But shouldn't you made a, you know, an hour episodes or put together some of the flashbacks in them training or something and why they left? I mean, they get to why Ahsoka is not her master anymore, but it just, it just feels weird. You know, so, you know, like... But the surroundings and the trappings make you feel like you're there. There's a little bit of inconsistency with Ahsoka between her attitude, but they're bringing her on an arc. You know, by the middle of it or the end, uh, she's like Ahsoka the White, like Gandalf type thing. There's even something in one of the wikis about it, that that was their thought. So, okay, so you wanted to do her arc. And it starts off, she's looking for the star map, and, you know, you've got... People getting broken out. Like, can they ever keep fucking anybody, like, in jail or in prison? Like, is there so much nonsense going around? Gideon is let loose. Uh, this chick, whoever it is, played by a great actress. Uh, um, but, uh, there's, um, uh, this chick is broken out now. They did something amazing where they put Ray Stevenson as a dark Jedi. Now, his apprentice, I don't know, she looks a little out of place to me. But Ray Stevenson steals the show, and it just sucks that he passed away. And fuck, what a, what a dilemma. Do you recast him? Do you just kill him off? I don't know. But he brought a presence to it, a big, imposing presence, the way he used his lightsaber. Just great. Now, the, 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 the other side of that coin is his apprentice and this, you know, they're doing a, um, uh, you know, she's a, they're not saying they're Sith, they're like mercenaries with their red lightsabers. And again, this is like nerd shit, but originally you had colored lightsabers and they were colored depending on the kyber crystal, right? And then all of a sudden, red lightsabers were revealed to be normal crystals that you bleed. Like, I don't know if that's still canon, but in my mind, I can remember Palpatine teaching Vader, 
to get his blade red, he has to like, torture his crystal, which is like a living thing. So how do these... Do you walk around with a green lightsaber and the more shit you do, you make it red? I don't know. But you've got two Dark Jedi, which is a good name for them, I guess. And Ray Stevenson just fucking nails it. He steals the show. Him and Rosario Dawson doing their, uh, you know, their fucking lightsaber battles is great. But there's an even better lightsaber battle when it's a lightsaber against a sword. There's some choreography in this thing that just doesn't stop. It's just great. It hits another level. Um, so they're really up in it like Daredevil did on the original uh, Marvel shows, like the whole, getting the people from the, you know, whatever. Anyway. Great stuff. But, again, you've got this uh, apprentice master type thing, and Ahsoka's got to go to Sabine for help, and Sabine is such a fun character in the show. It feels odd that they're in different states, but yeah, it is eight years later. I, I get it. But, remember, you you're, you're making it a Rebel Season 5. You're making it a Ahsoka Season 1. You're putting it in around the Mandalorian 3, and these shows have their own personality in it. Like I said, with Book of Boba, it didn't work for me. But it's there to fluff up what's going to happen and, you know, let's get to Thrawn eventually, who's the big baddie and the myth and the fandom of Star Wars, which was turned into legends in the books. Now, they did make more Thrawn stuff. I read the comic, and I'm not sure I'm not here to compare, but all right. So she's got to go to her former apprentice, Sabine, and get her help to crack this star map and there's some really good fights hk droid um but again you're scratching your head here and there not knowing what's going on however if you're not a rebels fan you're not a clone wars fan you're looking at this just from a a value of oh it's a star wars thing with lightsabers i think you're gonna have fun but the first episode does kind of leave your head scratching a little bit but it, it's the storytelling style they're going with and i'm okay but this brings up a point that i just started getting fucking angry at and i mean angry in a fandom way stop stabbing people with lightsabers through the stomach and the chest and letting them live it's fucking stupid now really stupid you've made the prequels, for whatever what they are, you had Qui-Gon stabbed in the chest. He falls down. Obi-Wan beats um, Maul, and he's right there in an installation. You know, train Anakin, and he dies. You could have hooked him up to gear, put him in a back to tank, whatever, right? After that, it has been, what, Reva has been stabbed in the fucking chest as a kid survived. As an adult survived. Now you've got Sabine Wren into the chest, left for dead, survives. I don't like it. I fucking don't like it. It just adds bullshit. You know, I don't, there's no stakes for me anymore. Because granted, it's, it's, it's enough for me to have disbelief that someone just thrusts a lightsaber in and pulls it right out. Rather than putting a lightsaber, thrusting a lightsaber in and pulling it to the side and nearly cutting people in half. Which is what you would do to make sure they're dead. So it's already suspending my disbelief that you're just puncturing and pulling out the same hole that you're corduroy, whatever the fuck it is. But you can't have it happen all the time and everybody fucking lives. Especially since you did it with the Obi-Wan show and it left a fucking really bad taste in my mouth. But you did it to a kid. He was like, what, eight, nine years old? And Reba was stabbed through the chest where she survives, right? And then she's older. It happens again. And she survives and goes to... A planet to continue her fucking adventure? I don't want to see this. And it really doesn't sit well with me. But you're having fun. It's Ahsoka. You know. You gotta go with it in a sense. But look. Acting is great. Some of the special effects. Whatever you want to call them are amazing. You're feeling this love in the show with Dave Filoni. And everybody, you know, sort of on point. For the, for, the, for the most part. And you're getting into the other, you know, they find out Thrawn's trapped in another galaxy. Um, but it's got to be a little bit of bullshit with Ren being a rebel still. But if you would have started it off a little differently and had them t 
tie in like our episodes where you did a 20 minute flashback or something i don't know i mean they get to a great flashback eventually but i don't know but you get to see sabine wren eventually and i love the actress everything seems well there's a little bit of weirdness with uh mon martha because this is supposed to be after obviously um andor so there's some good things peppered in here and there there's also connections to things i haven't watched yet but it does feel like the new republic or whatever the fuck are idiots what are you gonna do and then sabine after her death oh my fucking death you know decides okay she cuts her hair just like the show and i was like okay that's cool and she's gonna go with training again and be apprentice and she has shitty force powers but you get to see choppa and like i said talking about the rebel show and stuff it does add a lot it's again a little hard and head scratching when you're piecing together it's running alongside mandalorian and that you just saw her on a planet with luke skywalker and grogu which kind of fucking displaces a lot of shit in my brain but okay you know maybe they could do something new or different and just cut it out of the fucking history because when we see luke all fucked up deciding to kill his fucking kid in that flashback where's grogu sabine ahsoka like what will they may have happen i could see everybody just getting wiped out of people's memories like if this is an x-men comic book all right, but whatever. You start in the train, and there's a little bit of coolness with her being a Mandalorian and using a lightsaber. I get it. It just seems a little forced. Again, I didn't have a connection to the first introdu- introduction to Sabine. So in the show, she's a Mandalorian with the heritage. She gets the dark saber. I get it. I have no connection to her in ezra practicing she's force sensitive or kanan and ahsoka who wasn't really a major character on rebels for the most part i don't feel it so it just feels like they're putting it in there on purpose i don't know <clears throat> but again you got ray stevenson's you know stealing the show it's interesting what's going on they've got to bring this map to a special place and Fucking Sabine fucks everything up, and I guess she thinks Ahsoka's dead. Uh, Ahsoka, they got this star map, and the evil people are gonna find Thrawn, and then Ahsoka goes to stop, and she grabs this device and burns her hand. And as they're setting the scene up, Ray Stevenson knocks Ahsoka off this platform. And for the most part, I'm gonna guess Sabine thought she was dead, and... Ray Stevenson uses the force, I guess, and it's like, you're looking for somebody, you know, whatever. And she hands over the map. Just kind of weird in a sense. But story-wise, okay, she thinks Ahsoka's dead. She's got to go see if Ezra's alive. She hands it over, and he promises he won't hurt her. And it's a little contrived stuff. But you've got this actress from the... um mandalorian season who they broke out of fucking jail um i wish i had a better fucking yeah i think it's diana lee but um she eventually becomes like a I, a dark sister from dathomir they're gonna bring it they're bringing in the witches and stuff uh, that's eventually but they're looking to get this big huge space ring warp fucking hyperspace ring because they gotta go so far and they're stealing shit and as ahsoka and um hera go to look around it just feels so like dumb like the new republic just doesn't know what the fuck they're doing and they're trying to whatever anyway they're stealing huge fucking engines to make this thing happen and there's some cool story in there and dialogue. Anyway, the fucking night sister chick who was like she had the Beskar staff she fought Ahsoka with and lost. Anyway. Um so they, they, they're gonna go find Thrawn and but again So you're leading up with the nerds of Star Wars and their love of Thrawn. 
You've got Ahsoka, you've got the Rebels basically showing up all over the place. You've got tie-ins and little Easter eggs, great visuals, and here's the crux of it. If they find Thrawn, shit's over. Right, so they're going to go get Thrawn. He's so good. So you now in the, in, the, in the original novels, he is. If you put him on a Star Destroyer and have a battle fleet, He's going to anticipate things, and he's just uh, one of the greatest tacticians ever. So that's the threat. I'm guessing they're going with that. But for the show and people who don't know what's going on, I think they fall short with that because obviously they lose. Some being Ren goes with them, and they go through this fucking hyperspace ring. They also reveal Kanan's child through this show, and I thought it was a little weird, but... Force sensitive kid. Um, there's this thing with the Dathomir. It's actually one of the better parts, like that, have been added to these shows. Really, you know, when you think about the aliens that you see in all the cantinas and stuff, um, a major part of the storyline to be brought in with the Night Sisters, I thought was really good, and I really like almost everything about it except for some stupid shit. But again. A fun Disney Star Wars show, eight episodes, half hour each, bang, bang, bang. Most people are going to love it and have fun with it. I'm more getting into, you know, the nerd part and realizing you could have been, this could have been epic greatness and in a bigger, grander sense. But again, by, by the time you're like part six and you're like watching episode six, you know, you're so interested in what Ray Stevenson is doing and, um, what is his name? Uh, Balin. Yeah, Balin Skull. And his apprentice, that. Shin Hati. <laughs> Shin Hati. Uh, Ivana Soko plays his apprentice. Um, I wasn't buying it. She looks a lot like um, Scarlett Johansson, but anyway. So, you're at episode six. There's only eight episodes. You get to this far off galaxy. You know there's not going to be any in-depth stuff with that, but it gives Sabine Ran a chance to find Ezra. <clears throat> the plan to kind of go forward, Ray Stevenson's detection of something greater, his adherence to certain, you know, law and traditions of Jedi and how boy, how they were flawed. It's, sort of, it's starting to work here because you feel like it's going in a good place. And as much as I love to see Thrawn and love the actor, the voice, everything, um, <laughs> this is probably something that's online a lot, but he, he had a little belly, a little bit of a belly, which is okay. But he's so good as an actor in it. You've got Rosaria Dawson, and, and you know, she's recouping, and they, they do this huge beautiful fucking flashback with Ahsoka and the Clone Wars with Hayden Christensen and it's goosebumps smiles and fun you get to see fucking the Clone Wars as live action they even DA they, know, they, they bring in a young actress to play Ahsoka and it's fucking awesome everything about it the fucking other worlds portal shit they you know they mess with it was Fucking awesome. It was so much fun to see the interaction between Rosario Dawson and Hayden. He's like, oh, you're old. You look old. It just feels really part of the mythos that belongs there, the things that you wanted to see. And this is what I think they should have done more with Sabine to show the connection with Ahsoka because it's Apprentice Master and it didn't feel that way. But you're, you're along for the ride with the show and you're loving so much that's going on and once you meet Thrawn and Rosaria Dawson goes through her trials, I guess, in this other realm, uh, to live or die, is what, as Hayden says, Anakin, she goes through this montage of the Clone Wars and uh, the young actress, just the fighting, everything, the atmosphere is awesome. Thrawn is revealed and his presence is amazing, his actor, but you have to write this epically. And it starts to feel like, what the fuck is going on if my brain is a throwing guy? Not as a Disney 
watching a Star Wars having fun guy. So you've got two episodes left, right? You've got this stupid hearing shit with fucking Sindula is trying to convince the fucking Republic and this bullshit going on. C-3PO shows up. He's like, what the fuck is going on here? But this other world, Sabine Wren's with Ezra. Uh, Ashoka's got to find the whales. And now that she has this new lease on life and she's Ahsoka the White, she communicates with the whales. The ship goes in the mouth and they're coming to help. All right, so you're on this planet. You what? You got two episodes left. Sabine and Ezra just fucking chilling out, talking, and it, it's fun at first. But in the back of my brain, I'm going, "What the fuck is going on? Daron's got two days to get the fuck out of here, and you're gonna be trapped here, and you don't know what the fuck Daron is doing on his ship. He's lo- it looks like coffin. So I'm gonna guess he's gonna have an undead army, and you, f- you get to see fucking undead zombies eventually, but Ahsoka's got to show up. And by the way, David Tennant with the robot is fucking awesome. Um, I should have mentioned that from the beginning. There's a um, a cool dialogue and a lot of um, you know, insight into the characters is from Huang, uh, played by David Tennant. It's like a he was a droid that taught in the Jedi Order. Probably liked David combat techniques and stuff like that. He's amazing throughout the whole thing. But the crux of this is now Thrawn and his threat to this series, to the Star Wars world in general, the Star Wars universe in general. Because whether you use Book of Boba as a supporting character that Boba Fett's around, and I love that actor and you know, what they did with it in a sense, you've got the Mandalorian, you've got Obi-Wan, you are put in a weird position because even though this is after Andor, it should be for the First Order. So even though they did the Hux um, little thing in Project Necromancer and they're tying some stuff in with Gideon, where do you fit this thread in? So I, maybe I thought that it was going to begin and end in this other galaxy or delay him further and he's coming. And that's not where they were going. The Night Sisters imbue this fucking chick who's a great actress, you know, the nice sister with power, and they give her a sword, a magic sword, which I thought was pretty cool, I didn't think it was going to work, but man, that fight scene is fucking epic, but uh, listen, you guys, episodes 6, 7, and 8, this is the fear, Throne has been found, and he's coming back, but this the story writing and stuff just makes it seem that he's not who you think he is in, in, from the books already. This is okay, that's okay, we're going to do this, let's make this. And it happens his way because he adapts to it. Not that he anticipates, and you know, in the, in the books, he was known for, the original novels, and known for studying a race's art, and the people's art in particular, and getting tremendous insight to them. You know, so here he's adapting to situations. Now, granted, he's stuck in this place for eight years on a Star Destroyer that looks like it was pieced together. The Night Sisters helped him. Who knows who's alive on this fucking planet? Most of his troopers are probably dead. They're all, their armor is pieced together. Fine. But the story and the workings of him don't work for me. In the grand, oh shit, it's, it's drawn. So... Ezra wants to go back home. He's been found. Sabine's not really telling him what's going on. They meet these rock hermit crab people. And it feels like, what are you doing? It's slowing down. But okay, character development. Uh, Soka shows up. Bands together with them. Well, Tron's going to leave you all here. And you're all going to be fucked. Is it, again, there's, there's certain elements of this that just fucking make me scratch my head and drive me a little crazy. But... Yeah, you're having fun, and you see fucking Ezra. I don't like the fucking Avatar, I use the Force, Kung Fu shit too much. But okay, he didn't have a lightsaber, and he wanted to take his lightsaber back from Sabine, because Sabine is using his, and not the original one he made, that was a, a stun blaster, uh, gadget gun lightsaber, but okay. We've got tension mounting, we've got a 
you know, a race against the clock because Dawn's going to leave. How do we do this? Let's go. Fucking, again, once you realize Thrawn has TIE fighters, he's shooting whatever, he's on the planet, he flies in the ship, going to the ring, it's in space, he's got fucking people coming after him on, like, big wolf dog things. It doesn't feel right as a grand Thrawn, you know, epic culmination. It just doesn't. But as you're getting in and you're doing your fights and stuff, you're just carried away by some fun, really great stuff. Like, you know, going through who wrote one, each one and stuff is just, I want to give everybody credit in that sense. But it fails in certain areas. Again, if you're deciding to do 30-minute episodes, pack a punch, this is what you're doing. And maybe the Rebels drawn was a little more you know, insightful in his methods. You know, you want to see him with his hands behind his back looking at a view screen at space battles that are going on. Fine, he's doing that here in a sense, but he's doing it with, you know, or three people on dogs, and he's got his hangar bays loaded, and he's blowing up the stairway that leads to him. All right, so Sabine can't do anything with the Force. She's getting better at the lightsaber, but you can tell she's getting shot with her Mandalorian armor, and I thought it was perfect. I thought they... Showed that she's not a deflecting Jedi. She's using it more as a tool and as a weapon. But she's getting better at it. But they do this thing where a lightsaber gets knocked out. She pulls it to her hand. Kills the fucking thing. And there comes a point where they got to jump to the Star Destroyer. So, all right, here's a stupid fucking thing. Torn tells the new Night Sister chick from... The Mandalorian who got away when they broke out with the Beskar staff. She's a night sister. They make her, they give her tattoos and fuck with her skin and imbue her with power. They give her a magic blade and they tell her no one can pass. Kill them all, whatever. And she sacrifices because she knows she's going to go left behind. So, Ahsoka, Sabine, and Ezra come and she lets Sabine and Ezra just walk behind her and like it just didn't make sense, but okay. The confrontation with her and Ahsoka is fucking amazing. I loved it, the fight scene. But now, Sabine's got to get her and Ezra to the ship. They got to make a big jump. She says, okay, you jump and you pull me. He goes, I can't make it. She goes, trust me. And he does the force jump. And then she helps him force jump and boosts his thing. Now, it looked great because it worked in a way. But it didn't feel like it was earned. Like She went through the struggles she needed to. To break through and now she's a decently powered force user i would have liked to have kept did a little bit something more a little smarter and kept her on that edge of listen i'm not strong in the force i can't move rocks and stuff i could barely pull a cup to me as a matter of fact i don't think they showed but then she took the lightsaber i can get that but like ezra did things where he was stopping lightsabers just with his with the force which i get and it's kind of done in some of the uh, video games and stuff. And it's practical that I've done it in my role-playing games when characters have advanced enough. You know, if you're going to make a telekinetic force field, it'll, it'll stop a lightsaber or you grab it with the force. Anyway, so you've got this epic scene with Ahsoka versus the Night Sister, who brings weight to this. I like her as an actress, again. Um, there's just a lot of... Um, bullshit here and there and you got the ending now only Ezra makes it on the ship Sabine's gonna go but she decides to come back and help Ahsoka they kill the night sister they're trapped there Ezra gets through with Thrawn to I'm gonna say our galaxy but the Star Wars proper Ahsoka and Sabine are stuck on this planet now because Ray Stevenson steals the show in a lot of these scenes and he brings so much weight to this, you almost don't give a fuck because, holy shit, what's going on? He's on these statues and you know that the, the lore of Star Wars. And in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, hold on. They're, um, he passed away. They can recast him. But my mind got, like, fucking all disheveled when his apprentice goes back to the sand people on that planet and raises her lightsaber. Now, he told, the, he told the apprentice, our paths are going to divide, your ambitions go here. Uh, 
stay by the side of the new empire or something like that. So I thought she was going to go back to the throne. He was going to take her for what she's worth. But no, she's on that fucking planet. And so is Ray Stevenson, Balin. But he's passed away as an actor and he's going to see the secret. So what I'm guessing is, you know, in the books it's a little different. But let's say here for storytelling sake, there's a greater evil threat. The ancient Sith race, the real ancient Sith who, you know, perverted the Force and whatever. And that's where Palpatine and all these other Sith get their lore from and their secrets. And they're the big threat and they're going to come. I could see them turning Thrawn into an anti-hero. But, you remember, so your cult, you got from episode 6 to 8, you got a lot of action, stuff going on. They're not writing Thrawn epically. You've got... Undead lightsaber uh, battle, you know, they're battling the uh, stormtroopers that are getting risen from the dead. That doesn't feel like it has the weight it should have. You should have went a little bit more berserk with it. But okay, there's some great visuals. The fighting is fucking amazing. You've got amazing actors and actresses doing their fucking job like pros here. Whatever they got to work with, it, they're just making it fun and amazing. But again, so you, to me, the weight of Thrawn, him appearing over Dathomir, just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like it had the weight it should have. Now, this should be a... Uh, okay, so again, even if you're using Boba Fett as a side character, and maybe you give Obi-Wan another season... <laughs> You're fitting this in where Luke's already there, so Obi-Wan's out. In that sense. Because this is taking place after the battle, whatever, the Endor. Where do you position everybody? So, season two of Ahsoka would probably be them getting back, because her and Sabine are stuck there. Sabine would be a fucking expert Jedi now. I do appreciate that she blocks on her best guard a lot. But Jedi, you know, Mandalorian, I think they're pulling it off pretty well, except it feels a little forced. Are you pivoting everything now to Thrawn? So let's imagine the next season of Mandalorian is episodic, but that underlying story is the Rebel Alliance or the New Republic getting beat and having to withdraw and things are changing in the galaxy. I... Are they going to do stuff like that and then do the movie? Because I hear this movie, I don't know if it's definite yet. Will they do another eight-part episode, 30 minutes? So I'm a little confused. Now, if they go to Andor route and give me a 12-episode epic arc with Thrawn, I'm gonna, I would love it because the actor pulls it off besides his little pudgy stomach and whatever. I love the... I think he might be the original voice actor. So it just it could be done great, and that is the dilemma with me in these Star Wars shows. There's so many great elements. Uh, Hugh McGregor with Obi Wan. That show is fucking bonkers, stupid and dumb, but it hits you in the feels. It gives you the right amount of fun here and there. But as a critic, you can't. I can't give it a ten out of ten type thing. This is like better than average in a sense, and it's got way more going for it because of. Just what they were able to bring between dialogue, uh, character development, and just special effects. Uh, Ashoka is just amazing what she does, even as a kid in that flashback scene. I mean, she is, you know, the apprentice of Anakin. And Thrawn even mentions that. Um, I think he says, like, you know, who is this Jedi? And once he finds out that it, she used to be the apprentice for Anakin, she's like, he's like, oh, no, she won't quit. She'll make it. So, and he kind of readjusts the strategy. Because they actually do have law where Thrawn met Anakin during the Clone Wars and Darth Vader. And I think in the newer stuff, he knows Anakin is Darth Vader. So, again, no, this is after that, right? So, Thrawn will come back and he'll pick up the remnants of the Empire, unite them, start doing successful missions... So in there, they could really captivate Thrawn. And I heard they went to Timothy Zahn for this, the writer of the Thrawn trilogy. But I don't think he had enough room. They didn't have enough room here to breathe and make things fleshed out enough. 
Thrawn's antics here seem almost incompetent in some aspects, but calm, cool, and collected about it, and you know, move on, make his sacrifices. He's got to get back. Fine. And I really hope they pull that off because it's going to be or can be fucking amazing what the character was in the books and what they tried to do on the Rebels cartoons. So Ahsoka is a fun ride for me. I recommend it without a doubt. It is visually stunning. It's got some good character growth. It's got a lot of stupid shit here and there. And they missed the mark on Nailing Throne, but I think they're saving that. And could that have been a mistake? I don't know. Maybe you should have made this a little more closely knit with The Mandalorian, Boba Fett, and pieced together Season 5 of Rebels before you did this Thrawn thing. But right off the bat, we're with... I mean, they kind of did it with the other uh, show, because The Mandalorian, I think Ahsoka's mission, the reason why you see her anywhere is because these people are looking to bring Thrawn back, and she's trying to find Thrawn, so she thinks Ezra might be alive. Fine. But maybe you could have told that over a 12 fucking episode, one hour show. So, uh, I really, I recommend it. It's a fun show. Great for that, for what it is. But a part of me gets a little annoyed and aggravated at some of the decisions they make. Some of the shows are long and short. I get it, you know. You want to do your serialized, you know, Western stuff. With the man, and it worked and has charm. But here you're trying to tell an overarching story arc with a beloved villain threat that's kind of sandwiched between the Emperor and Snoke, I guess, or the First Order. And, you know, you, you got this period of time to really go crazy and really wow the Star Wars fans. But for the most part, they are. This is so much better than the other shit. Um, and, you know, watching the stuff again, like, even though... Like season three of Picard kind of turned it around. Star Trek, like this is better than that stuff for that, you know, theme that you're going for. It's just Star Wars, lightsabers, blasters, space battles. Um, and you're introducing an epic, beloved character with intrigue and in- intellect. And it just doesn't hit all the cylinders right. It doesn't, but good enough that I say watch the show, had fun. Rosario Dawson, Ray Stevenson. Bring Hayden Christian back, watching the flashbacks from the Clone Wars. Just real awesome stuff in here. Overall, a, a, a worthwhile show to watch on its own, fitting into the Jedi and the Rebel stuff. It's probably better for people. Like, oh shit, this is my season five of Rebels that I never got. And you've seen Kane and Son with Hera. I, I could see people really loving this. I wouldn't. You know, I'm not going to knock them. I love it in a sense, too. But when I do the podcast, I try to just really be honest with some of the, you know, some of the underlying things that really annoy me, but could be correct and could be greatness in the end. Let's see what they do with Thrawn. Let's see how they work this out in the end. So watch Ashoka. Uh, Tell me if I'm wrong. I, I really see a lot of greatness here, beautiful stuff. Visually, I'm laughing. I'm having fun. I'm smiling. But I'm also scratching my head, like, rolling my eyes here and there. And I guess that's the love of watching these shows. But Rosaria Dawson nails it. Ray Stevenson, you know, rest, is, rest in peace. He's got a fucking epic. He could have had an epic thing going on here. And they kind of dropped the ball with that. And his apprentice is there with the fucking people. It just kind of feels weird. But watch it. So, there you go. Ahsoka. Work watch for me. Definite watch for fans of the Rebels and Clone Wars. You're going to fucking go nuts. You love it. And I think it's got promise to go to get even better. Because, like, again, it feels like people who love this stuff are there. They just, you know, you got rioters making mistakes. You're, you're making decisions that just don't sit well with me. But other people are going to love. Watch Ahsoka. All right, everybody. I hope you're doing well. My best to you and yours. Take care.